Well, good morning for those of you that are watching on television. Glad that you're here. We certainly would like to have you in person when you get the opportunity to come and sit in the sanctuary and worship with us. But in the meantime, we are so glad that you tuned in to be a part of our service. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you. Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, because I am holy. Amen, and let us begin worship. So she's playing up here, here, and has the footwork going. It's not easy. Organists are rare. We're very thankful and blessed to have Sally to play organ and piano. So as a call to worship, as a worship leader, I want to have songs that will encourage you, will inspire you, will get you up, get your blood pumping. So not just one of these is good, but both of these are great. When the roll is called up yonder, followed by... Jim's favorite, I'll Fly Away, in number 600, and 601, let's all stand. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, this time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the Savior birds shall gather all, and the roll is called the yonder I'll be there. When the roll is called the yonder, when the roll is called the yonder, 
fiction was driven by religious people. The brightness of his life, however, will transform minds and hearts who acknowledge the greatness of Christ. This precious treasure, this light and power that now shine within us is held in a perishable container that is in our weak bodies. Everyone can see that the glorious power within must be from God and not on our own. <laughs>
Father, we desire that you would be honored, um, in, not just in our words, but, uh, but in our heart. Lord, I ask that you would uh, meet with all of us right where we are, that you would be our teacher. Um, we thank you for your word that, that gives us direction and hope, and uh, you bring revival to our souls through your word. You uh, bring us comfort and strength and direction, and we thank you, Father. Uh, Lord, we need you. And uh, we pray for this church, that you would be honored here. We pray this in Jesus' name. search our souls and be worthy of these elements we're about to partake in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ and his uh, crucifixion on Calvary's cross that we may, we may be uh, forgiven of our sins. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. In these things we pray in Jesus Christ's most holy and precious name. Man, welcome to the Lord's table. We celebrate, uh, in fact, 
this is the uh, the most uh, uh, amazing ordinance that, that Christ has given us. And so we celebrate today the offering of Christ, the blood of Christ. The scripture says this, which is very, very, very significant. He says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just, Jesus, for the unjust, me and you, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So we rejoice in his offering. <coughs> the cleansing of our sins is what he's done for us. We give thanks. <laughs>
absolutely marvelous. Thank you guys very, very much. I uh, went to bed last night. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, somewhere I suppose, 8.30 or 9 or something. And I woke up around 11 and I, was, I kind of felt like it was time to get up. I, thought, I was just felt like I was ready to go because I was ready for Sunday to be here. And, uh, and it was just like a little after 11. It really felt strange. The next thing I know, uh, I, I wake up again around 1.30. And I'm thinking, it's got to be time to get up. You know, I did. I, and uh, next thing, I, I wake up around 3. And then I wake up around uh, 4.30. And my alarm goes off at 5. And I just thought, man, it's got to go off at some point. I thought, man, does it work? So I, I get up. I got up a couple of those times. And uh, I got up, like I said, around 4.30, and I saw that it was uh, not time yet, so I just laid there. And finally, the alarm went off, and I was tired. <laughs> and uh, so then I, I got up and got ready and, and came, and uh, I'm glad I did. Well, we are going through the book of Mark. We'll finish soon. Uh, I really had anticipated to jump into chapter 16 after we had talked about the death of Christ, the, that, that divine narrative, that divine uh, record that we have of the, the crucifixion of Christ, which is very, very significant. And, uh, and I wanted to just jump into 16, but I, I just kind of kept looking over the passage because, because the Word of God is so full and has so much in it everywhere that you look. And there was one Verse really that just stood out. Um, it was it was the, the the narrative here. the The record here is that when Jesus was on the cross, and um, they came, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, a a religious man. He was a a prominent man in the Sanhedrin along with Nicodemus, we find in other records, such as in John, came to take the body of Jesus. But what is interesting is, is what happened here, because he's recognized as a secret disciple. He's recognized as a secret disciple. What, what would possess a person to be a secret disciple? Well, uh, one is that he was a prominent religious man in the Sanhedrin that were trying to get rid of Jesus. So uh, he was going to lose a lot uh, if he were to make it clear that he was a uh, disciple of Christ. And the other reason, not only losing that place, that, that his reputation, being associated with somebody that was rejected by everybody else, um, was a fact that early on, I would say he didn't know how great Jesus is. Why else would someone not want to identify with the Son of God? <laughs> because it weren't, it, it didn't quite take hold of of the heart yet to see how great he is. In fact, the disciples, of course, they took off, didn't they? They ran. Um, John, of course, stuck around for a little bit at the cross with Mary, but nonetheless, you know, let's look at verse 43. If we can just pull that one up for me, Brent, here in, in Mark 15, 43. It says, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, there it is, went in to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. You see, it was a secret. But going and doing this was going to run around, was going to get out, but he went and he got the body of Jesus, but he took courage. Every generation needs somebody, needs people who will 
take stands that is God honoring no matter what the crowds say. There needs to be people that have courage. Now courage doesn't mean that you're not afraid. But courage is something that you do even when you are afraid. You see, what drove him? What drove him was the fact that really when it all came down to the bare minimum was what? He was waiting for the kingdom of God. That was it. We find the same kind of mentality for people who stood when it wasn't easy. They had their, their faith was in God and in God alone. God was more important to them than anything else. They were going to do what was honoring to him. We see it all through the scripture. We could look at Daniel. We could look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's what those guys did. The, the, the rule of the land, for example, with Shadrach, uh, Meshach, and Abednego was that they were to bow down. Everyone was to bow down to that golden idol, and they weren't going to do it. And the threat was that if they didn't, they were going to be cast into a fiery furnace. You can read about it in Dan Daniel chapter 3. But there's, there's, there's got to be those people, there's got to be somebody who just stands for what's right, regardless of the consequences. You need people with that kind of, of, of uh, love for God. That what he says takes precedence over everything else. It was uh, John and Charles Wesley were persecuted severely because of the, the things that they taught when the Methodist church began. Jonathan Edwards, who was one of the greatest minds America ever produced, uh, was a man that was persecuted because of what he taught. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said this. This was their words in, in Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. They actually said this. They said, look, we're not going to bow down to that idol because God tells us not to bow to anybody, so we're not going to do it. They said, uh, when well, you're going to get thrown into the fire and furnace, that's fine. God can deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. That's the faith that God brings us to. We don't simply follow the crowds. We follow Daniel, same situation. Daniel, Daniel chapter 6. Uh, what happened to him was that uh, the, uh, the other wise people in the Babylonian uh, kingdom there, um, they didn't like Daniel. They didn't like the attention that he was getting. They didn't like it that he knew stuff that they didn't. And they wanted to get rid of him. And so here's what they did. They asked Darius, King Darius, if he would sign a decree that if anybody prays to anyone but you, O oh King Darius, let them be thrown into the lion's den. King Darius thought that sounded pretty good. He forgot about Daniel because he liked Daniel. He signed it. Daniel heard that he had signed it. You know what Daniel did? was told that he couldn't pray to his God for 30 days. He said, 30 days? I'm not going to wait 30 minutes. <laughs> and he went home. He got on his knees, opened his window as he always did. Wasn't going to hide. See, just because the law of the land is something doesn't mean that it's right. There's got to be those people those people who take courage, like Joseph of Arimathea, he took courage, went into Pilate, and asked for the body of Jesus. See, normally what they would do at the cross was those people were usually left there on the cross to rot, to shame them. And 
God had better intentions. In fact, what they would do is after they rotted, they would take them off of the cross, the tree, and they would take them and they would throw them into a place called Gehenna, which was a, a refuge place that burned all the time. They would take these bodies and throw them up on there. God didn't have that in mind. In fact, it was prophesied that, that uh, he would not see, his body would not see corruption. Because he was going to raise it. And that's what he did. And so, as we consider these, these truths, we consider the, the, the mentality of, 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 of people in the scripture who stood. They stood and, and, and they did what was right, even if it was going to cost them. You'll bring up that first point for me uh, for a moment here. Uh, it says, uh, how does one stand... When you're abandoned. Left alone and your reputation becomes identified with the one the whole world has just rejected. That's what Joseph did. But I want to show you another verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4 if you'll bring that up. And I want to read a few of these verses beginning in verse 14. And I'll show you how that someone, why this person could stand alone. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. 15. <clears throat> you also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Look at verse 16. At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. Now, I may not be held to their charge. You, you, you see, you know, stay right there. Thank you, Brent. You see the spirit of that? It's like, uh, Lord, don't, don't. Don't condemn them. I love that. Where does that spirit come from? God. From Jesus. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But the Lord stood with me. There it is. And he strengthened me. So that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the line. Uh, of the line. Notice this verse 18 says this. <clears throat> And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. There it is right there. To him be glory forever and ever. I want him to be glorified. Not me, not anybody else. But I love that because his mentality was the Lord stood with me and beside all of that, God's going to deliver me safely into his kingdom. So there was a recognition of the sovereignty of God. There was... It, the, the, whole, the whole thing comes back to even the title itself. When courage is driven not by pride, not by popularity, but the sovereignty of God. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to do what's right, even if it costs me. That's the mentality of those of faith. I mean, wasn't it, wasn't it crazy how Job had said, I mean, this is somebody who just trusted in the, just trusted in the sovereignty of God. When, when Job had lost all of his family, I mean, I mean, his own, his own wife told him to curse God. I mean, he just, everything was gone. His, all, everything. And this is what he said. Among several incredible things, he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. That's what he said. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In fact, he goes on to say a little bit later in Job, he says, even if he slays me, I'm going to praise him. That's somebody who figured out how great God is. That's somebody who figured out how satisfying God is, you see? And so, when we look at the scripture, we find that, that there are those few people who are willing to stand. It's like Jesus, if the Bible says in Hebrews, that he endured the cross, despising the shame, as he, as he entrusted Trusted in him, he entrusted himself to the Father. 
It's a beautiful place, really, to come to for you and I, where we finally come to a place where we just, we're going to trust Him. God is the one who is my protector. He is my creator. He's my provider. He is my protector. He's my, he is the one who will bring me to, he'll bring me home. It's where we say, God, you're the one who has determined my days. I accept it. It's trusting in the sovereignty of God. Because he controls all things. So, let's talk about this for just a moment. Because I want to go back and talk about, if we remember Joseph. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, it says that he took courage to go to Pilate. And ask for the body of Jesus, which that, that in itself has some implications. Why did he do it? Because he looked forward to the kingdom of God. He was waiting for God to show up. Because that was more important to him than anything. He trusted in God. He knew God was going to come back. He knew that. He trusted in that. But, but, but before, he was secret. You know, if you bring up that last point, isn't that great to say the last point? Um, growing up in Christ is a lifelong journey. And your maturing is developed and observable in the arena of conflict and rejection. You see, you see, you don't really find out how, what a person is like when, you know, your bank accounts are full and everybody loves you. I mean, anybody can be nice and kind at that point. But what about, what about when um, somebody says things about you, they attack you? What about that? What, what are you, what's your reaction at that point? And so... We, we, what happens is God actually takes the, he takes the trials that we have and he develops us. And it is in the trials that we have that it becomes observable as to what you are really like. You follow me? Because that's who we are, isn't it? Who we are is in the secret time. And who we are is in the troubling times. I don't know about you, but sometimes, maybe often, I don't know, sometimes that's disturbing. <laughs> it's like, oh man, why did I respond that way? See? Let's look at a couple of verses of Scripture. By the way, the thing to do is read 1 Peter and you'll discover a lot. Uh, but look at 1 Peter um, chapter 1. In fact, I got 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7. I want you to notice some things. I'm going to turn over there with you because some of you are already turning over there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. It says, um, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Christ. In other words, God will literally take the trials that you and I have to develop us into what? He develops us into a place where our faith becomes real. Where, where it's not just in word, but our faith actually uh, becomes stronger. And watch this, and he even purifies our faith. You see? He purifies it. Or uh, you'll notice, let's notice, not only does he purify it, but, 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 but it actually exposes us by the way we respond. Look at chapter 3 and chapter 3 and verse 13. And notice this. 
Uh, and we'll read down through verse 16 for a moment. Just a couple of verses is all we're going to do. But watch this. It says, and, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord your God in your heart. Set him apart there. Let, let prayer be such an important part of you and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope you, that is in you with what? With meekness, with gentleness and fear and reverence. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. So here's, uh, I'll just stop right there, but here's the point, is that, is that it, as you and I deal with conflict, I don't know if you guys ever deal with it, but, 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 but if you're going to be alive, you're going to deal with conflict. So how you respond to that becomes very, very important. Jesus taught us, he said, when he was reviled, didn't revile back again. That's what he taught us. And so it's possible to actually live like that. And, and, and what is so interesting is it says that, that, that be ready because they're going to ask you, what is the reason for that? What's the hope that you got? <laughs> why, what's, why are you okay? You see, uh, the Holy Spirit coming into our lives changes us. Makes us different. Makes us better. I didn't say perfect. Not even close. But have you noticed how you how, how how you respond differently now than you used to? Have you noticed how that um, how that you have a, a higher regard for people that you that you that you you desire to honor him? Have you seen the growth that's taken place in your life like that? Have you noticed it? I'm going to say this again. Growing up in Christ is a lifelong journey, and your maturing is developed and even observable at times in that rejection. See? So, the bottom line really comes, comes down to this for us. You see, uh, we look at Joseph. And he did something for Jesus. And it didn't matter to him what it was going to cost. His reputation was not more important than Jesus. He loved him that much. Daniel loved him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abel loved him that much. God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, said, hey, don't be afraid. You're going to have battles. But I'm going to be with you. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your word. It's, it's rich and it's good. And, um, I pray that you'll help us that you'll help us as a church to be so focused on Christ that we forget about ourselves. We're so focused on, on the honoring of you that we forget about the crowds. Help us. Help us to have that kind of a love you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord spoke to you. Uh, you want to pray with me? I'd love to pray with you. We, we're going to sing together all the way my Savior leads. Stand with us please, would you? Number 474. Let's all stand.
scripture in Peter to me is, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You don't even see him and you love him. To me, that's the best part. Thank you for coming. Certainly hope you can come back. Hope you'll bring somebody. We need more people. You know, we can double the size. If everybody just invites one person, we double. So let's do that. Let's see if we can't bring somebody. Easter's coming. It's not far off. So we need to see what we can do. Bring more people into your word of God. Anything else needs to be mentioned? All right. Well, thank you. Hope to see you Wednesday night. If not, we'll see you next Sunday. Would you please dismiss us? Father, we thank you for all your days. Message.